So uh, this class is about independent media, some, some selected topics and issues uh, within the independent media and what we term independent media broadly is what is non-corporate media. So aside from other distinctions, uh, points of distinctions with the mainstream. So Mickey, why don't you just uh, introduce us uh, yourself and talk about Project Censor's work. Uh, in particular, the annual publications that you bring in and how do you apply the term censorship to media reporting? Yeah, thanks, Raza. It's uh, it's an honor to be here with you all. Of course, uh, we're we're big fans of of the Park Center, and uh, of course, we knew you know Jeff for years, Cohen, and of course, are big fans of the Izzy Awards. I F Stone, um, towering independent journalist of the 20th century, century, following in George Seldes' footsteps. Um, and in a lot of ways, Project Censored really comes from that tradition. It comes from um, that 20th century tradition of media criticism. Um, you know, George Seldes and I.F. Stone and uh, then A.J. Liebling at The New Yorker, um, they really kind of set this tradition. Of course, prior to that, Walter Lippmann, you'll notice I also am a historian, uh, so I, I can't help but notice the things that happened before and how they affect us now. But Project Censored um, was founded in 1976 at Sonoma State University in Northern California. Just uh, it's about an hour north of San Francisco. Carl Jensen founded the project. He had a newspaper background, an advertising background, um, and he helped develop the communications program. Uh, and so he kind of straddled the worlds of comms and sociology. Um, 1976, what was going on? Well, that was um, an interesting year. Uh, we had an election with two people who, in fact, the only time in U.S. history where the president and vice president weren't elected. Um, and so it was an interesting year, but it, Carl Jensen was looking back at sort of how we got there. And out of the 1972 election, Carl had wondered well, how is it that Richard Nixon was able to win such a handy landslide re-election, given the history, the corruption, the failures in Vietnam, et cetera? Um, and part of that was, was sort of hanging on uh, the myth of, of um, uh, Watergate out of the Washington Post. And some of you may have read, uh, in fact, this was just the 50th anniversary of, uh, of some of those, those reports, that Woodward and Bernstein did. Uh, Jensen looked back at the independent press, not the, the establishment or legacy press that the Post was, and he noticed that there was actually reporting going on prior. He actually noticed that there were other people writing about the Nixon scandals, the Nixon problems. Um, later, Jensen also unearthed the fact that the Nixon White House directly intervened with CBS, with the head of CBS News. At the time, Walter Cronkite, of course, was a household name as a news anchor, um, a, a trusted source of television news, of network news. This is eight years before cable, right? This is before CNN, before cable 24 seven news. But uh, Carl unearthed the fact that the White House was trying to say, and did successfully suppress some Watergate stories at CBS only to later come out in the Washington Post. But what Carl discovered in the process, that there wasn't even a phrase for this yet, but what Carl was really doing was practicing critical media literacy. He was looking at the power structure behind media, who was reporting what, who controlled what got out and why. Uh, and that was really the genesis of Project Censored. So what Carl did is he turned his whole class into a project where students would interrogate, investigate, and collect sources of independent media, not corporate, not legacy, not mainstream, but weeklies like city papers, uh, other small pub uh, publications, some, of course, that had been around since the 19th century, like The Nation, or from the early 20th century, like The Progressive and, and many others. He literally would collect hundreds, this is before the internet too, right? He would literally collect hundreds of these things and his students would gather them up and they would look for stories that they thought were important, you know, national, international stories, not just local stories, not that local journalism doesn't matter. We can maybe talk about that later in the problem of news deserts uh, and censorship in local communities. Um, but, but Jensen wanted the students to learn about how news media worked, how the media functioned, 
while unearthing these really important stories that he later collected into a top 10, top 25, and that's what Project Censor became known for, he created a panel of expert judges and journalists and academics that would evaluate and judge these stories for accuracy. And later, the second director, Peter Phillips, ex it really expanded the program in a lot of ways. And when I came in as associate director in 2008, director in 2010, we moved the project to 20 or so different campuses. And so we work with college professors and students all over the country now. And in fact, we work with some in Canada, um, Central South America. We also are partnered with a, a group that's based on projects censored in Germany called News Enlightenment. Um, so it's grown a lot. You know, we a lot of folks don't realize that we've been around since 1976, but uh, you could argue in some of our um, some of the people we work with have long argued that one of the most censored stories in news media is in fact project censored, that we have this long uh, existing culture of media criticism that, you know, really goes back in many ways to, to Lippmann and, and Seldes and Stone and so forth. Um, but we turned it into a literacy project. And so each year we now publish an entire book. Since 1993, it went from a list to an entire book um, so this is the book we just did that came out in January. Andy Lee Roth and I just finished the next book, um, State of the Free Press 2023, which will be out in December. And I will make sure that you all get copies of that as soon as I get them before the semester is over, uh, if you want to share them with class. Um, but in a nutshell, that's sort of the history of Project Censored. That's what we do. We cover the news that doesn't make the news and we analyze why. We deconstruct propaganda. Uh, we talk about the relationship of propaganda and control of narratives to censorship. In the last five to seven years, we've been especially busy because people have been fretting about the moral panic over fake news, which is nothing new. We've been dealing with that since our inception. Um, but in a nutshell, Raza, we try to, to bring to light these great independent news sources. Uh, everyone in the censored book really, in many ways, could be up for an Izzy Award. Yeah. Um, these are people that do bona fide grassroots investigative reporting on key issues that matter that just don't seem to see the light of day into the corporate media. And if they do, there's usually a lag of anywhere between 12 months, two years. And when they, if they do get picked up rather than language in obscurity, they're often put into a corporate frame where they're spun or distorted or partially reported in a way that is not necessarily accurate to the original reports. And that's what we mean too by propaganda. So you mentioned definitions of censorship. Um, our definition of censorship hasn't changed much since Carl's time. We think censorship is anything that interferes uh, with the free flow of information in a society that purports to have free press principles as protected under the First Amendment. And there are five freedoms protected under the First Amendment, um, even though only one in a thousand Americans know what they are, while 25% of Americans can name all five members of the fictitious Simpsons family. Um, people don't know what, what, what the right, all the rights protected under the First Amendment are, which means it's harder to protect them. The free press is one, but there's a curious caveat here that you all maybe have discussed, of course, and that's that the First Amendment allegedly is designed to protect against government interference, right? And so one of the main criticisms of Project Censored over the, over the years was, you all aren't talking about government censorship, you're talking about news judgment. And so our founder, Carl Jensen, um, who, who died uh, back in 2015, um, he said, okay, I come from a news background. That's a fair assessment. So let me take a look at this news judgment. And is it really news judgment that's keeping these important stories out of the press, out of the establishment press, or is it something else? Because they would complain about column inches, only so much time. Again, this is before the internet. This is before 24-7 cable, so these were legitimate concerns, right? Um, but what Carl found instead, and he later coined this term in 1983, junk food news. He found that there was no shortage of sensationalist tripe and gossip and nonsense. Um, you know, a lot of yo-yo reporting and sporting scores and, you know, things that maybe people are interested in but really don't matter in terms of civic engagement or for people being well-informed to participate in a democratic republic. That morphed into an analysis chapter every year in the book. So since 1993, we've done a book a year. Last year, we founded the Censored Press. We're doing five books this year, so we can maybe talk about that later. We also, in 2010, started a national radio program on Pacifica Radio called the Project Censored Show. 
And Raza, I am overdue with inviting you on to be an esteemed guest. So I'm hoping that you'll agree to be on here <laughs> later this semester. And I certainly pleasure. want to feature more of what you all are doing at Ithaca, which, by the way, is amazing and fantastic. That's why it's uh, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, Thank you. We're such fans of your program and what you do. And I just, you know, I, I don't want to keep rambling on and on. I'd rather just open Hello. things up and have a exactly. conversation. I'm more than happy to talk about anything you'd like. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to get the students in it, but I think uh, what I would really uh, appreciate, and I think students would also love uh, to hear, is that, well, you know what, if you can give like one or two examples uh, that um, from the book that you published in 2022, uh, you know, yeah. in terms of the story censored, you know, <laughs> not, and so just one or two examples, and then perhaps, um, uh, you know, uh, the upcoming story that you were talking about in uh, oh yeah years, yeah right? absolutely um you know a couple of the and by the way the top twenty five stories are online for free a lot of what we do is on our website for free at projectcensored.org but there's also a lot in the book that isn't online per se and that's the junk food news the news abuse propaganda analysis that Robert Anderson from Fairness and Accuracy and Reporting does we have another great part of the book on media democracy in action that highlights um, great reporters and organizations and nonprofits that do amazing First Amendment work. But to these stories, uh, Raza, um, one of the stories I think that really got my attention in this, pa this past year's book was, um, you know, right around the top of the list here. And, and by the way, we talk about what constitutes censored stories and what our methodology is and how we do this. It's all very transparent. It isn't just Andy and I sitting by the water cooler saying like, hey, that looks like a good story. Let's throw that in the book. Um, it's, it's a little more procedural uh, than that. But one of the stories here, well, the top story was prescription drug costs are set to become a leading cause of death for elderly Americans. And so in the throes of the COVID pandemic, what some reporters were doing um, at Common Dreams, for example, were looking at studies that said, yeah, COVID's a problem, but here's a bigger problem on the horizon. We're going to see um, a massive increase in unnecessary deaths caused by people who can no longer afford life-saving medication, right? So here's, here's a story decade in the making in the wake of the opioid epidemic and crisis that our own for-profit healthcare system is literally, um, well, as some Republican and, and right-wing critics called Obamacare and, and, and the public, this, uh, we didn't have a public option, but what they called the Obamacare program was, was a death panel we actually already have a death. We have death panels. They're called insurance companies and they're called big pharma. Um, <laughs> these, these companies have such extraordinary lobbying control and advertising control through media, which then shapes what media report and don't report, that this is a story that's right under our nose. And AARP has reported about this. Um, West Health and uh, Exenda in Canada have reported this. So it's not like these stories haven't been reported. The Hill covered some of it, um, but this is on the horizon. We're looking at a major problem for elderly Americans that's you know right under our nose and nobody seems to be talking about it. So these are the kind of stories that in the tradition of the project dating back through Peter Phillips and Carl Jensen, these are the kind of stories we think deserve public attention, but are just less likely to get it because they're crowded off the front page by either junk food news or what's Putin doing today. Um, you know, notice that there's no reporting about what's happening in Yemen or in Palestine, but mm -hmm. there's no shortage of what's happening in Ukraine, for example. So it's, it's, and, and so what we do is we not only look at those kind of stories that push things off the headlines, off the front pages, we look at the stories that should be there, but aren't. And another one is journalism itself under threat the second story is journalists investigating financial crimes are threatened by global elites. That's the second story. Uh, Foreign Policy Center released Unsafe for Scrutiny, a report about threats faced by journalists who are investigating financial fraud, like Pandora's Papers, the Panama Papers, um, this kind of financial corruption that's eventually, uh, you know, WikiLeaks level kind of information. And reporters are, are, are on the front lines for this. Reporters themselves are being targeted. They're being spied upon. Uh, the beginning of the book this year, Raza, we actually talk about the major threats to journalism as a major censored story. Mm. Um, because you know, Reporters Without Borders is literally reporting about the 
physical threats. You know, the United States last year was 44th out of 180 countries in world press freedom. Let that sink in. In the exceptionalist country of we're number one, we rank 44th on the press freedom index. How is that? Well, if you go and look at the literature, you'll see that the United States actually is a very unhospitable environment for reporters. We had some 500 reporters attacked. 85% of attacks on journalists are by the police. Um, attacking wow. reporters, att stealing their cameras, destroying their cameras. Many of these attacks happened in social justice protests in the wake of the George Floyd murder. So there's no shortage of this information that is available if one is media literate, if one knows where to go. But if we live in the clickbait world of like, share, and you know, fake social media where half of Americans go to get news, that's the problem. Yeah. We also live in a world where people just click the clicker and they want the corporate media to beam into their confirmation bias zone. Um, if, if they want to own the libs, they'll tune into Fox or OAN. Uh, if they if they want to uh, you know stick it to QAnon, they'll tune into MSNBC or CNN uh, and stick it to the Trumpers. But it's that kind of biased, siloed media that Project Censored calls out on all sides. We we right. all suffer when we are only subject to these mass top-down managed news propaganda campaigns. And what we do with our research is we say, look, there are people doing real investigative journalism, and most of them are doing it on shoestring budgets. Many of them are piecemealing together freelance lives when doing these things. Some of them are academic. Some of us are adjuncts. Some of us are fortunate enough to have tenure, um, which means I've been saddled with a bunch of department work and bureaucracy <laughs> that kind of get, gets in the way of students and fun things. Um, but we hope that we are showing by example um, and, and, and hope by imitation that students eventually come to see what journalism really can be. There is a crisis in journalism, but one of the biggest crises, Andy Lee Roth and I just wrote a piece this week that'll be out on, online, um, on what, what would happen if journalism disappeared? Well, for many people in the United States, it already has because they don't know what it is. Mm. And, and so they don't see CNN or Fox as journalism anymore. They see them as adjuncts of political parties vying for their votes or their attention. And what's happened is it's degraded and eroded public trust in journalism, a degree to which most Americans don't recognize ethical journalism because so few in the corporate sector seem to practice it. And that includes the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. You know, we're equal opportunity in our critiques and criticism of what we think has happened to journalism. And we hope that some of the work we do highlights the kind of journalism that does exist that we can simply use more of and people I hope become more aware of, which is again, something I think that you all do at Ithaca, when you honor these amazing independent reporters, you're saying they're out there and they need us to help elevate their voices and spread this news and information to more and more sources. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, uh, amazing and you know I've uh, I've been I'm a regular reader now for many years and often uh, I'm struck uh, by the fact uh, that uh, you know how can the mainstream or the corporate media get away with this this kind of I mean you know health I mean uh, citizens health is a I mean it's it's a crime uh, yes. not to be reporting about it I mean you know let alone it's it's not just a, a regular omission, you know. But anyway, coming back to the so, can you say a little bit on the methodology you apply, uh, yeah. very briefly on how you select these stories which are censored uh, from the from the mainstream? Um... Yeah, yeah, sure. In fact, I'll throw into the chat here too a link to our validated independent news um, curriculum, and I will make a shameless plug here. We would love uh, folks at Ithaca, if they wanted to participate in this, to really check out Project Censored in the class Classroom. And we would love to have submissions of stories that you all think are underreported and should be investigated. Here is a link to what we do at the project. These are called Validated Independent News Stories. It's one of several assignments that's really easy to do across the curriculum. Uh -huh. you know, we even talk to like people in like, um, you know, I don't know, oceanography classes, 
you know, we'll, we'll like beam in and do media literacy there. And they'll be like, what are you doing in an oceanography class? And I'll say, well, how many of those studies that you see in your peer reviewed journals are accurately reported in the corporate media about climate change, about ocean acidification? And immediately the professors go, I can't get my, the New York Times won't cover my studies and they, Fox News won't call me and CNN doesn't care. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and we say like, well, right. So you need media literacy in oceanography. <laughs> <laughs> right, we talk about it across the spectrum, right? This is everybody's challenge. It's everybody's problem. So what Validated Independent News is, is we go, there's Andy and Steve Masick too. Um, and th this is a simple video. We have simple instructions. We have students uh, learn, of course, the difference between corporate establishment legacy and independent media. When we say independent media, we don't mean quote unquote uh, objective, like in a laboratory. You know, and mentioned Seldes again, Seldes once quipped, George Seldes, um, the job of journalism isn't false equivalency. It's not to be objective to the point of fault and error. It's to tell the public what's really going on. It's to help the public understand complicated issues, lead them to transparently source facts, and decide themselves what they think is going on and debate it amongst themselves, right? We're supposed to have robust discourse and debate in our media. Well... You know, that seems to be lacking, and that's part of our challenge and problem. But this methodology invites students to comb over independent news sources, understand what their objective is or what they're looking for, but then it also has students research them and do some basic things. And that means let's look at the story and let's assess it for accuracy. Let's assess it for significance and timeliness. Here in the chat is a link to our categorized independent news sources not at all an exhaustive link, just a place to get started yes. for people that are like, when you say independent, what do you mean? Is, 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 is this source independent? What, and what does independent mean? Again, doesn't necessarily mean, quote, objective. It means non-corporate, mm. right? It is right. a non-corporate source. It is a source that is not a for-profit entity. We have six corporations that control about 90% of media and about five big tech companies. So if you're heeding the warnings of Ben Bigdickian from the early 80s on Media Monopoly, he was the canary in the coal mine when there were 50 corporations that were running the media in the United States. And he was blowing the whistle. He was saying, whoa, I see, I see a problem here. And he was right. He was quite prescient in his criticism. Um, and then later that spawned the, the media propaganda model from Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky about the, the political economy of mass media and why the corporate ownership and advertising and reliance on establishment sources and ideological uh, biases really frame and corrupt information that passes as mainstream news. So we invite students to look at independent media and assess their biases, but also their factual efficacy. And we want them to say, why is this story important and why was it not being covered in the corporate media? And I'll tell you, you know, Raza, when we talked a little bit ago, um, one of the things that you brought up, of course, is climate. And for years, Project Censored has called out climate stories. Some of our number one stories have been on the climate crisis. And, you know, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting did studies year after year on how in a world of uh, corporate and weather in media, where every year there's a storm of the century, every month is the storm of the century. <laughs> You know, we kind of look like, well, how many centuries have we blown through this year? Um, what they never want to talk about is why. They don't talk about the core and they don't talk about the role of fossil fuels and the global capitalist economy and carbon footprint of the U.S. military industrial complex, which is the largest polluter on the planet. And the Pentagon and all of its contractors are exempt from environmental regulations. We've been covering this story for years. It was a top story over a decade ago. Abby Martin, whom we've worked with for a long time, in fact, started her show on the basis of what we do with the project, who's now on the Empire Files. Um, she's now teaming up with Dar Jamal doing an incredible documentary on exactly that story, the root of our climate crisis and global imperialism. And these things are connected, but the corporate media, they never can seem to bother to connect these crucial dots. And what we discovered this year, and this is a sneak peek for your students because this book isn't out yet, but lo and behold, 
In fact, so we're having our conference next um, next weekend, October 21 and 22, the Critical Media Literacy Conference of the Americas, and we're having a whole panel on this and the climate crisis and propaganda. The top story in our next book is by Eduardo Garcia. Uh, he's out of Colombia in New York. And the top story, which again, it's a mind blower for us how this doesn't get picked up in the corporate media, writing for The Guardian. Um, I'm sorry, Tree Hugger. This one was in Tree Hugger, but The Guardian also covered it. Garcia wrote, fossil fuel companies receive $11 million a minute in subsidies. Subsidization of $11 million. Wouldn't it be cool if you students at Ithaca were getting student loan money like that? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if we were subsidizing our future by subsidizing your education? Well, Raza, we can't do that because we're too busy spending that money on fossil fuels. While the yes. fossil fuel companies are advertising on corporate media that won't report about this, while the fossil fuel companies are spending more money on advertising than on renewable energies. British Petroleum was spending more money on, on what they were doing to clean up the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico than they were spending on the actual cleanup effort. Corporate media will never report about that. Why? Well, because who's advertising? After the sports, it's BP and their new green flower logo. They're not a bad oil company polluting the earth. They're interested in your future. And here's our flowery logo to prove it. Um, you know, I could go on and on and on about these examples. In fact, we do, unfortunately. We go on and on and on every year in several hundred page books, hour long weekly radio shows, annual conferences. Uh, we give talks all over like this one. Um, so we go wherever someone wants to hear the truth about our media ecosystem and our media ecology. And we cannot have a free press without having a critically media literate public. And we cannot have a well-informed public if we don't have an actual independent free press. So yes. these things are all very symbiotic. And it's actually courses like these, as you know, Raza, that are unfortunately rare. Um, yeah. Classes like this should be mandatory. Yeah. I mean, should in be high mainstream. School, um, I mean, in well, high school, yeah. we just finished a book called "The Media and Me: The Censored Press" that's coming out this fall. That's specifically a critical media literacy book for young people, targeting people as young as twelve and as old as eighteen, nineteen. That's an introduction that we think every person in this country should have access to media literacy education. Not corporate media literacy, not, not a critical literacy, not military literacy from NATO, as that mm. article points out. But we should have critical media literacy, critical pedagogy that goes behind the scenes, who controls the narratives, who controls the power structures, who determines what is reported and why, whose voices are suppressed and why, and what can we do about it to have a more sustainable democratic form, small d, participatory, inclusive and equitable media system in this country. Well, amazing, yes, absolutely. Uh, without that, as you ri rightly say, without an informed public, you, you can't even think of the idea of democracy because it's going to be manipulated, it's going to be hijacked the way it has been done in the US and many other nations. But absolutely. anyway, yeah, so let's open it up for students. And for those of you who have questions, please, uh, raise your hand or if you have a comment, um, please go ahead. Uh, Brianna, Sid, Samar, Hannah, Jaden. Yeah, any and all questions, any and all takers, including yeah. criticism. I'm game for criticism. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, I guess I'll ask this, I guess. Um, so what, what are some, I guess, the um, internship opportunities you have that are available for, for undergrad students? You said internships? Yes. Yeah. So it's, it, um, right now, we actually have an intern from Loyola Marymount in LA. Reagan Haney is our fall intern. Over the summer, we had four interns from across the United States, from community colleges, state universities, um, to private schools. Um, we offer spring and fall internships. Some are paid, some are unpaid. If it is, um, the paid internships are, 
application process and we'll announce that in the fall. You can sign up for our newsletter at projectcensored.org. It's only one a month, but it announces things like this. Um, and we welcome the very kind of folks that are in this class, <laughs> right? We're like, yes, if anybody in here is interested in this, we'd love to hear from you um, because we, we really want students that are already excited about this work to come work with us. Uh, and it's, of course, remote work. You don't have to be in, in fact, nowadays, we're all over the place. We're not just in Northern California. Um, but the unpaid internships can be done with units, too. So a lot of your programs have requirements that you have to do some kind of external work or field work or something for units. Well, we do that all the time. One, two, and three unit kind of courses where people will work with us and we will mentor them. We'll do VINs research. Some I'm, I'm linking right now um, our latest film from 2020 uh, that Abby Martin helped edit and finish with us. It was actually shot by students. The students filmed it, edited some of it. They helped come up with questions and they interviewed people with us. So in many ways, we had students helping make a documentary about fighting fake news. And how do we fight fake news? Well, with not with fact checkers. Um, we fight fake news with critical media literacy education. And the best way to do that is with students, is by getting students plugged in and they're on the front line. They're part of the misinformation and disinformation defense in their peer groups, among their friends, in their families, right? We rely on young people to be media savvy and to understand that landscape and to help other people understand it. So a lot of our interns are folks that are, well, they're, they kind of geek out on the news. They're really interested in media. Some of them are very interested in social media and the, and the, the dual-edged sword, the fine line of social media is a real problem and it's an addictive problem and it's a misinformation problem. But how do we use social media in ways that uh, can can be beneficial for social justice causes? How can we use social media to get people interested in real legitimate information and news sources? Well, some of the best people we work with are young people uh, on those kind of projects. So I would say um, be on the lookout this fall for another call for interns starting in Jan. We'll start in January. And from January through mm, April, is when we're really looking at the stories coming in from people submitting stories. We have our panel of judges that ultimately look at whether we have 150, 200, 300 stories that make it through the vetting process. And student interns are really helpful in that. They help us with formatting, with fact checking. Um, they do write-ups on VINs themselves. So if you go and look at the Project Censored book, what you'll see on the stories is you'll see the sourcing of, okay, what was the story? Where was it published? And then you'll see student researcher, um, Sam Adamir, North Central College, faculty evaluator, Steve Masick. Well, Steve Masick is one of our VINs coordinators and Shem Adamir graduated from North Central. He's now a paid research assistant for our former director, Peter Phillips, who's writing a follow-up to Giants, the global power elite that'll be out next year. So the people that we welcome into the project family and broader network are people that we tend to, we want to work with. We try to stick with them and we, we follow them through their career. We try to give as many opportunities as we can to people. And, you know, even our current webmaster was a former student. The people that made the second Project Censored movie in 2013 that went all, won a lot of awards at the film festivals, that was a former student that had Peter Phillips' first class on Project Censored at Sonoma State University that went on years later, later he's a real estate guy, who said, I, I, wanna, I wanna give back to community, how do I do that? Well, they financed and made a documentary about our work. So you know, Project Censored is really kind of, is, a, is a family, it's a network of people that really care about media. And we're, grow, we're fortunate that we grow and change. And I think one of the, the favorite thing that we do is work with young people, uh, Jaden. And so I would welcome you to feel free to email me directly if you'd like. It's Mickey like the mouse, Mickey at projectcensored.org. Um, oh, sure. I'm happy to put any of you in touch with Andy Roth, Steve Masick, our new editorial associate, um, Shaley Voidel, who was a former intern that is now working with us all year as an editorial associate at the Censored Press. 
So we try to practice what we preach. We try to practice what we teach, <laughs> right? And we kind of, we try to walk the walk and it's no, it's no, we don't hide it. We think that young people and students are, they're our best hope for the future. And I think they're the ones like right now on the climate rebellion, uh, uh, extinction rebellion on the climate initiative. Young people are on the front lines of many of these challenges on debt relief, on climate crisis. And at Project Censored, we hope to invest as much as possible into helping the young people really build an independent, truth-telling, independent media system in our country, because we desperately need one and we need all the help we can get. So I'll put some links to our films in here and I'll also put my email address. But if you're interested in doing anything with us, there's multiple levels and layers that it can happen and there's no right or wrong way. You could, you could sign up and say, I'd like to submit a VIN if I could. And I would say, great. <laughs> Uh, does Raza want to be a faculty evaluator? Um, do you need us to help you know, look at those stories? And just let me know. We'd be more than happy to work with you. And we can even team you up with some of our current interns who've been doing this for six months. Um, and they can bring people into the fold, as it were. So I'd, we'd love to hear from you. Great. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, who's next? Any question or comment or concern, feel free. Any advice you, you want mm -hmm. Mickey to give you? Yeah, um, this made me think about um, like, uh, about like 2020. Um, uh, I can't think of the name. Um, when, um, uh, okay, I'm having a, you're okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm making you out. I, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, there was like a, uh, what, what was it? It was the building that was being um, berated by a bunch of people during 2020. Um, I think it was. Oh my gosh. Are you are you talking about the January 6th Capitol incident? Yeah. Yeah. The Capitol riot. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And like there was a lot of. Um, people posting about how the police were you know breaking people's cameras and um, oh yeah like like trying to ruin um a lot of their equipment um and you made a comment today about like how uh i think you said um 80 percent of oh, 85 85 percent of, of attack and reporters are done by the police yeah um, and then I also, uh, like with the readings that we had this week, um, I was reading about how uh, a lot of people who use social media because it's like the most accessible outlet, a lot of people now just really listen to things that are more accessible to them because it's just at the reach of their fingertips. Um, they're aware of how a lot of fake news can be posted and put out there. Um, I think it was like, 80, I said that 80% of people um, that um, are on social media are aware of fake news being posted, but they're not really doing anything about it um, because eventually it'll be um, like busted um, and exposed and clarified. But I think that with, with what you're talking about for um, putting out like, um, sorry. Uh, publishing real real news that like not um, yeah like putting out the truth about our media and, and the ecosystem. I feel like a lot of people in our day and age would definitely be open to learning about it if we had if it was more so on social media and more easily accessible. However. I noticed that with people being so used to um, exposés that it's kind of become like, um, it's become so normalized, exposing, cancel culture, a lot of this. And I feel like accessibility is something that is prioritized nowadays. Um, so I'm just thinking about if there was a way that this kind of media could be presented where it's more accessible. Yeah, we're nobody. on. It, ironically, as much as we critique, and thank you, Samara, thank you so much for um, for your comments and your observations, all very apt. Um, 
er, really erudite observations about the conundrum, um, the, the, the very platforms that many young people use for information are simultaneously mass proliferators of propaganda and misinformation. And so, um, as Raza said earlier, one of the pieces that we just put up, Nolan Higdon put up at our site, um, Nolan's co-author with me of Let's Agree to Disagree, uh, Critical Media, a Critical Thinking Guide to Communication, Conflict Management, and Critical Media Literacy. There's a whole chapter on social media that talks about exactly the problems that you were highlighting we have in here. Um, we also co-authored this book on United States and Distraction on media in the Trump era that, that wasn't about Trump, but just the circus, that the sensationalist circus that media has become. And let's not forget the CEO of CBS News, Les Moonves, said that Donald Trump may not be good for America, but he's damn good for CBS. Like, wh what's that tell you about the bias of our network news system, right? It's very problematic. But we have to be careful uh, because not all media literacy efforts are equal. And that's one of the pieces that's on the front page of our site right now, looks at efforts that NATO is undertaking to teach media literacy. And of course, if you go, and if you go to the corporate media sites, this is the same thing. They use, Facebook uses members of the Atlantic Council as fact checkers. Who's the Atlantic Council? The Atlantic Council is the public relations arm of NATO. <laughs> and they are all a bunch of military industrial complex people. Um, TikTok has a whole bunch of former CIA Pentagon people and MI6 people on their advisory boards, like intelligence committee people. So these are not neutral observers. These are people that are now situated to manipulate the record at its source. And if you go back to the media critic and political scientist, Michael Parenti, who's in our second film and was a longtime judge for Project Censored, Parenti pointed out chiefly that the type of censorship in the United States often happens by proxy. It's not the kind of by government that I mentioned earlier. It's by corporations. It's by Twitter. It's by Meta. And they want to say, well, we're not censoring this. We own these platforms. But those platforms, I think you were just alluding to, those platforms have become our public square. That's where we all go to hang out with each other. Look, for better or worse, I'm I'm somebody that tends to, you know, agree with Siva Vanathian about our anti-social media and how it's you know driven by addiction. And the same people that designed these platforms design casinos in Vegas, literally. Um, you know, social psychologists used to manipulate people to stay on a site. Uh, th these are not people that have our best interests at heart, I would argue. Um, but now these platforms are being used to fact check for us. And what we need to be very careful about, like NewsGuard is an example. There's a, co a company called NewsGuard that has a software that uploads in Microsoft and it puts a little shield at your site. So if you go in your browser and you have Chrome, you have, Chrome, you have NewsGuard in it, It'll 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 put up a warning if you go to a certain site. Like if you go to CNN or Fox, it'll have a green shield. Green means go. Green means good. Um, but if it has a yellow or red shield, it means that the 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 powers that be in NewsGuard. And then if you go and look at their board of directors and see who you're talking about here, they think that the journalists at Mint Press News are disinformation agents and they're not reporting the truth. Well. I happen to be at the board of Behind the Headlines, the nonprofit of Mint, Mint Press News. I know Alan McLeod, who's one of their chief reporters, that's a PhD media studies scholar. Um, I happen to read his journalism, which I have never found to be factually inaccurate. Yet according to NewsGuard, they're fake news. And the reason that's problematic is that it's trying to outsource critical thinking through this kind of software. And eventually these people write AI bots to do this for them. And they gradually filter out even fact-based journalism if it doesn't correspond to an approved establishment narrative. Russia bad, Ukraine good. You don't need to know anything else. Um, climate crisis bad, corporations are going to save us. Um, electric cars are gonna save us. Well, what's the dirty truth behind electric cars? Lithium mining, um, 
what's the dirty truth behind this so-called green revolution? It's mostly based on coal uh, and oil and fossil fuels, which are subsidized to the tune of $11 million a minute. Notice how this, this tangled web we weave behind the scenes is there. We can pull back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz. We can see, like some of these people, like at NATO, I mean, this, this, one of these, we know the woman who's writing this media literacy report for NATO. And needless to say, we disagree with her. And we believe that she is knowingly hijacking media literacy to promote propaganda. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's what we're, and we're opposed to that. We're not opposed to NATO per se as media scholars. We're opposed to anything masquerading as transparent factually sourced news that isn't. We're mm. against people that are wolves in sheep's clothing that are there to get more eyeballs for advertisers. They're not there to report, seek truth and report it. They're not adhering to the eth code of ethics of the Society of Professional Journalists, which include doing no harm, reporting, seeking the truth and reporting it, transparently sourcing your information and allowing for diverse and robust debate and discourse, including constructive criticism and disagreement. Believe you me, we've, we've actually published in some of these folks' journals. We've been censored by some of these folks in these journals because we criticize their corporate military industrial complex friendly version of media literacy. And we've actually published whole chapters in our books about it. We did a whole movie about it. The movie that I posted up there um, in the chat on uh, the United States of Distraction, Fighting the Fake News Invasion in 2020, the whole movie looks at that problem. The problem of fake news isn't just fake news. It's the people that have hijacked and weaponized fake news to promote their own fake news in ways that is more sophisticated than the Trump campaign. But let's remember that the fake news epithet came from the Democrats and the DNC that were trying to cover up the fact that Donna Brazile and the DNC cheated and suppressed people in the primaries, and then they later admitted it. You know, at Project Censor, we were reporting about that. We were reporting about Cambridge Analytica long before the corporate media ever found out and weaponized it against Donald Trump. The problem here isn't Trump's fake news, it's anybody's fake news. And one area where the left really falls for this trap is they just think that fake news is a problem on the right. They oh, yeah. don't want to look at their own biases. They don't want to look at their own, um, we're not allowed to say blind spots anymore, but I'm old. Uh, so uh, they, they don't look at the, the oh. area. In other words, we all have confirmation bias and implicit bias. And we bring that with us wherever we go. The best we can do is be aware of it so that we not only are aware of our own shortcomings cognitively, we can also constructively call out others in a way that is more didactic and less derisive. And I know that's not easy, but it's important to do if we wanna build bridges, not walls. We have to talk to people that have different ideas and journalism is supposed to help us not only be exposed to different ideas, but also understand them and be more and, and exercise reciprocity, cultural competence, and empathic listening. All very difficult things to do. It's one thing to talk about them and, and teach them. It's very difficult to do when you're face to face with a person with whom you vociferously disagree. Right. Um, it's very hard. But that's what we wrote this book about. That's what we wrote this book about. We wrote this book because, well, we wrote this book for people that probably aren't going to read it. <laughs> but we wrote it because we can do this. And at the center of all this is, is critical media literacy. At the center of all of this is having honest, truthworthy, independent journalism that wants to report the truth, that wants the public to understand what's really going on and let the chips fall where they may, which is why it's so important for students today to go back and read In Fact by George Seldes in the 1940s, the first major US press criticism publication. It's important for them to understand I.F. Stone wanted to, he wanted to start In Fact over again once Seldes was blacklisted. And Seldes said, no, don't. 
you'll be blacklisted too. You better start your own thing. The I have Stone Weekly. Don't affiliate yourself with me. They've already thrown me out. You know, you're going to need to rebrand yourself. Um, so look, for as long as there's been media criticism, there's been people in the establishment that try their best to marginalize us because we tend to stick to a, a we have a different moral compass. Our compass is guided by the Society of Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. It's, it's, and it means that it takes us places that we don't always agree. You know, at Project Censored, I don't agree with every story we publish. I don't agree with all the perspectives of all the people that are in our books or on our shows because I shouldn't have to. What, what, where the agreement lines up is in our principles. And if we, if we value free press principles, if we oppose censorship in its many guises, then I think we have a base to work from. And I work with people from across the political spectrum. I work with the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. I work with the National Banned Books Week Coalition. We're part of the Banned Books Week Coalition. We're part of the National Coalition Against Censorship with Chris Finan and others. And Project Censored is about way more than just underreported news stories. We really try to live and breathe the ethos of the First Amendment. And we think that it's among, well, we think it's among the most important uh, that we have. And we really hope that young people understand that all isn't lost, that we do live in a chaotic world, and the world that you have inherited is complicated. And more and more efforts to simplify it are part of that complication, as Summer was just saying, right? How do we, how do we sift through the noise? How do, we, how do we find the truthful voice? Or how do we find the truthful part of that report, which was also partially false? <laughs> What do we do with information that's partly true and partly false? Well, I say we have to call that out and we have to live with it and we have to integrate it and we have to build relationships with our sources like we build with each other. And we build a sense of mutual trust where, and again, I, I don't get an opportunity to quote Ronald Reagan very often, <laughs> but when I do, uh, I quote him saying, we need to trust that our sources and our institutions have best interest in heart, but they need to verify the information that they're delivering. They need to prove to us that what we're being told is true. And we're seeing that right now, not just in news media with trust in news media cratering, we're seeing it at the CDC. We're seeing it at the WHO, where now their directors are coming out and saying, we so politicized this information and we so botched some of this information that we've degraded our own standing in the scientific community. And what this all contributes to, Raza, is something that we call an epistemic crisis. It's a crisis of epistemology. Mm -hmm. Post-truth is an epistemological crisis. We do not live in a post-truth world. Post-truth is a propaganda mechanism being posed upon us Absolutely. by the established order to obscure factual information. And the best weapon we have against it, the best defense we have against it is critical media literacy education and an open and free society. Absolutely, absolutely. How well put, eloquently and uh, sharp. So I know you uh, you have to go to another meeting, uh, Mickey. So I've I'll got go a few minutes, so I'm happy to hang out if so, anybody wants to talk. Yeah, I think uh, let's check with uh, others in the class. Um, if anybody has a question or comment, otherwise we let you go <laughs> because uh, you've uh, been very kind with your time. Uh, so any other questions or comments? I anybody guess. else? If, because if not, Summer, um, we just wrote about that. <laughs> I'm seeing your comment in the chat. Andy and I have a piece called What If Journalism Disappeared? Look for it. It should be over at the conversation or salon later this week. Um, regardless, I'll send you a copy of it, Raza, um, because we talk about the rise of news deserts and we talk about a history of muckraking journalists going all the way back to Ida Tarbell and uh, Upton Sinclair, the brass check, Lincoln Steffens, who had a series called The Shame of the Cities. You're exactly right. Gotcha journalism spawned yellow journalism and, and gave rise to the Hearst Empire. And that was the that was the junk news, fake news of its day that took the, the, the muckraking investigative reporting of these people, and it sensationalized it. And it mimicked its tone without the evidence, right? So it wanted to just get the eyeballs into the newspaper, by the newspaper. 
But what they didn't know or what they didn't care about is that it takes time. It would take Lincoln Steffens months to do his Shame of the Cities expose on St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Cleveland. He eventually turned it into a whole book two years later, 1904. But that's when the newspapers started to say, hey, they sniffed it out. There's money to be made here. And that's when gotcha journalism got branded and co-opted, right? And so that's why the yellow press degraded journalism. It's again, it's historic. His, Mark Twain, history may not repeat itself, but it seems to rhyme. <laughs> So here we are in a we are in a golden age, I would say, of muckraking journalism. We publish stuff every year, the Izzies every year, the work the work that independent journalists do every year is there. We just need to get it out there to more people, and we need people to be more media literate so that they can tell the difference between gotcha journalism, junk news, news abuse propaganda, and good old-fashioned muckraking. As the founder of Project Censored once said, Carl Jensen, he said, our journalism programs, our media programs need to turn out more muckrakers and fewer buckrakers. And I think that if we had a system that focused on that, we'd have a really different media landscape today. And I really think that we can do it, but we've got to do it together. Programs like Project Censored and the Park Institute and FAIR and Propaganda Critic and Prop Watch, um, the, the Critical Media Project, the Critical Media Literacy Project of the Americas, we need to work together. We need to band our forces together and move forward with our common goals for information literacy, news and information freedom, and we need to oppose censorship and cancel culture wherever we see it.